Welcome everyone to our BGJ podcast for the month of September. I'm Andrew Duckworth and a warm welcome back to you all from your team here at the Bone and Joint Journal. As always, we'd like to start by thanking all of you for your continued comments and support, as well as a big thanks to our many authors and colleagues who take part. Our podcast continue to focus on some papers published each month here at the BJJ and highlight some of the great work our authors are doing. So today I have the pleasure of firstly welcoming Professor Elvary Zivian, who is an orthopedic surgeon at the FIFA Medical Centre of Excellence in Kwaru Hospital in Lyon, to discuss their paper entitled Delaying Anterior Cruciate Ligament Reconstruction Increases the Rate and Severity of Medial Chondral Injuries, a Retrospective Cohort Study, which has been published in the September edition of the BDJ. Welcome, Elvary. It's great to have you join us today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Joining Elvary is a colleague in Lyon and co-author for the paper, Professor Seb Logistic. Seb, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time. It's a pleasure. And finally, to round off this great panel of experts, we have our brilliant editor-in-chief here at the BJJ, Professor Faris Dad, to give his insights into this really important study. Prof, great to back, have you back with us as, as always. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Sorry, if I could start with yourself. The aim of your study was to evaluate the association between chondral injury and the time interval from ACL tear to surgical reconstruction. So maybe as a background to the study for our listeners, can you give us a just a brief overview of the state of the current literature on this topic and what caused to look at, caused you to look at this question in particular? Uh, of course, there is there has been already several papers on this topic, but the most recent ones are a bit controversial. For example, the the big meta analysis from uh, Pro Domidis and Al published two years ago in EJSM found a higher risk of chondral low grade medial injuries. Mm-hmm. when dealing ACL reconstruction for more than three months, and an increased risk of high-grade medial injuries when delaying for more than one year. However, because it is a meta-analysis, it is difficult to compare different populations. So uh, what I wanted the department to get better answer for our patients. And indeed, in France, it's very common for the patients to ask about the risk of delaying surgery and how long they can wait for personal and or professional reason without damaging their knee. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And that's a really nice overview of that meta-analysis and like you said, the controversy around it. And maybe if I come to Seb and Faris, maybe Seb first, giving you, is that your own sort of personal clinical experience with this? Uh, and I suppose particularly maybe very relevant at the moment with the long waitness certainly we're experiencing here in the UK since the COVID pandemic. Yeah, absolutely, we have the same problem facing, you know, you know, limited OR time. So we have a lot of these, you know, young, active, you know, patients who had, you know, sports injury, and we have to delay their, their you know, their access to the surgical field. And the consequences we see more and more of these chondral, you know, injury associated when we, they get to the OR. So that that's potentially a big problem. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And prof, similar for us in the UK, would you say? Absolutely similar at the moment. I mean, I think to give you a bit of a backdrop, Andrew, we looked at this over 20 years ago when uh, we were starting to set up acute knee clinics because knee injuries were going to general clinics, being seen in fracture clinics and essentially being dismissed. And we published, God, must be 20 years ago now, showing that we could reduce we could reduce the time to diagnosis of ACL injury dramatically by having dedicated clinics, but also by bringing that forward, we saw many fewer chondral injuries so you know this this really replicates on a larger scale something we all recognize it's a huge danger with covid when a lot of places just were not allowed to do this kind of soft tissue knee reconstruction and i think there are real implications here not because pushing the fast forward button for surgery is one solution Mm -hmm. but another one of course is just to advise patients what activities they can and can't do one of the big confounders here is what are patients doing to cause this chondral damage? Is it related to instability episodes or is it something that's happening anyway in a subtle and unstable knee? There's lots we don't understand. Absolutely, absolutely. That makes And that makes a lot of sense. So maybe, just conscious of time, we can move on to the study design. So this was a retrospective cohort study of an initial 1,840 consecutive ACL reconstructions performed at your centre. So if you could maybe give us a brief overview of the inclusion and exclusion for the study. So our inclusion and exclusion criteria were pretty usual. We exclude partial ACL tear, multi-league, education for a uni and HTO and ACL, of course. And a last exclusion criteria was patient under 16 or over 70. Mm-hmm. And so we used our ACL database from 2012 to 2022. Mm-hmm. 
And from 1,800 patients, we had 1,317 patients reaching all the inclusion criteria. Yeah, absolutely. And it's very nicely laid out in, in the figure in, in your study and uh, in your paper, sorry. And, and in terms of the, how you broke down, obviously, that was the, the how you got the patients. In, in terms of the timing of the surgery, how was that sort of determined during the study period? And how did you break them down for this this sort of this study? Actually, in France, uh, for non-professional athletes, the waiting list is not very long for ACL uh, reconstruction or to get an appointment with any surgeon. I know it's different in UK, but in France, it's not so long. Yeah. <laughs> it's not two years. It's not one year, for sure. And so um, in case of indication for SCR reconstruction, patient complaining about instability, playing sport, of course, the surgery can be done as soon as the patient has recovered full range of motion. Yes. So except in case of a bucket handle, mm-hmm. the patient can mostly choose the time of his surgery within one or two months. So the yeah. waiting list is not so, so, so long in France. Yeah. Uh, but for the paper, we decided to break down the groups every three months because three months were the cutoff from previous paper. Yeah. And so now I, I should say I didn't change really my indication. Mm-hmm. I may postpone now some patient what's uh, muscular insufficiency yeah because i'm yeah. doing isokinetic testing before surgery and mm-hmm. sometimes when the crowd is really too bad i will postpone the surgery otherwise yeah. i will not change my my indication that's interesting and that, and that we can come on to the breakdown of those in those groups but that's that's really interesting and Seb, if maybe i could come to you and um, i suppose one of the, the key parts of it was the assessment of the chondral damage how was that sort of sort of done and, and by whom so it was, you know, objective, you know, assessment during the arthroscopy. So every uh, arthroscopy, we've been, you know, assessing cartilage damage using the ICRS classification. Three senior surgeons involved through the 10 years, you know, period. And the assessments, were, I would say, really consistent uh, throughout yeah. the, the three of us. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good thing about it, isn't it? I think with the three of you doing it, it's and in particular with that time period as well. And that's that's very true. And and maybe before we move on to the results, Seb, it, it, the you mentioned the, the pre Pre hop, pre op rehab protocol was sort of was was it standardized and, and and if so, what what did it sort of briefly entail? Yeah, no, the aim we did have this you know very standardized protocol. The, the aim was to have the patient ready for you know the surgery, and so it was to go back to full range of motion. Absolutely no you know flexion contracture was uh, tolerated. We did you know at some specific protocol for muscular reinforcement and try to aim for you know pain freeness. So we had these three you know, uh, features we were giving the, the red light for, you know, surgery. Yeah, no, that's very clear. That's very clear. And I think that's a really important part of of, the, of how you progress the, then on to surgery. I think that's that's great. So, Elvry, maybe if we come back to you, moving on to what you, you found. So there, there were a total of, like you said, 1,317 ACL reconstructions were included over that sort of just 10-year period with the median age of almost 30 years and two-thirds were male. So sort of what you'd expect. And in terms of when the ACL, ACL reconstruction were done, there's sort of, they're just under uh, under a third, less than three months. Similarly, just under a third, three to six months, and then about uh, almost twenty percent were done six to twelve months or over a year. Um, and so, Elvin, what did you find in terms of, I suppose, both the rate and severity of the condyle injuries, and how that was associated with the timing as well? So, in terms of the rate and con- of condyle injury, we found seventeen percent of medial cartilage injury from ICRS one to four and 9% on the lateral side. Uh, but the main finding of this study is on the medial compartment, delayed ACL reconstruction. In the medial compartment, dedeling surgery more than one year mm-hmm. was highly associated with a significantly increase both rate and severity and condual injury compared to early surgery before three months. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, we didn't find any correlation for the lateral compartment and it looks delaying ACI reconstruction did not influence the risk of condual lesion on the lateral side. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's like you said, that's it's a very clear, clearly laid out that in your sort of primary analysis. And in terms of you, you did some quite interesting, I thought, secondary and sensitivity analysis. What did you find with those? And regarding secondary analysis, an increased technique activity score was significantly associated with a lower rate and severity of condual injuries. In the medial compartment, on the lateral compartment, older age and BMI 
were both significant factors associated with Cornwall injury. Yeah. In the sensitivity analyze, we found minisculpture was significantly associated in the lateral and medial compartment mm -hmm. with the rate of severity of Cornwall injury. Yeah. Overall, delay seemed to be associated with many sculptures in the medial compartment, but not the lateral one. Yeah, and I think those, those secondary and sensitive analysis are, really ha hammer home that, that key message, I think, really nicely. So if we move on to sort of the implication of it, and spend a bit of time on this, you know, in, you know, the strengths and the importance of the study to my eye are very clear. You know, it's large, if not the largest single centre study looking at this association between delaying ACL reconstruction or the delay from tear to re re reconstruction and condyle injury. And, and the study really highlights that delaying surgery was, as you said, in, associated with an increase in both the rate and severity of medial chondral injuries with a, a real like a dose effect fashion, particularly for delays more than a, a year. And and as we've said, the younger patients seem to be at higher risk. So maybe, Seb, if I could come back to you, how... How do you interpret these findings sort of moving forward? And, and was I suppose, was it what you expected them to be? So, yeah, I think number one regarding age of the patient was quite a surprise because we would think that, you know, all you know, patients would have more cartilage damage. But I think why young patients are at risk is because they are not quite, you know, they try to maintain their level of activity, but they have an unstable knee and they create cartilage damage. So actually it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. When you think about why is it the medial compartment, is it just uh, the well-known biomechanics of the knee when you have an ACL rupture, you increase, you know, the load on the, the, the medial part, you, you, you change, you know, the bi bi biomechanics of the knee with also more risk on the, on the you know, medial, uh, you know, meniscus. So we know that the lateral tear, uh, the tear of the lateral meniscus occurred during the trauma and the, you know, tear of the medial meniscus most of the time when you have, you know, in instable knee. And if you try to, to maintain your activity. So all these together actually make sense. And I think that gives a pretty good idea of, you know, which kind of population is really at risk and that we should, you know, really get the, the optimized, you know, timing for ACL reconstruction for these patients, especially the, the young ones. You know, I think that's a great, great, great way to bring it all together, Seven. I think, like you say, I think, like you, you say, in terms of behavior and activity of the younger patients, that sort of that sort of makes sense in terms of why that would be. And so, Prof, if I can maybe come back to you, what are your thoughts on this results? And I suppose, was this also what you expected and what you experienced in your day to day practice? So in short, it is. I think it's a great paper because I think it highlights the real world of what happens here. You've got to remember that this is an area where there's been a big, very lauded RCT from Scandinavia, the Frobel study, the Canon trials, which have basically emphasized uh, re the role of rehab as a primary intervention in a large number of patients and shown, frankly, no major deleterious effect to delaying, in those, pa de delaying those patients. Now, this is where you've got to look at the generalizability of the patients who go into that study compared to our younger population and the reality that away from Sweden and that group of patients, things are different. As, as you probably know, we've, under, we, we've undertaken, David Beard led, led for us the ACL SNAP study, which I'll be mentioning in my November editorial. And th that has shown a slightly different scenario within NHS patients. And in some patients, it is right to intervene early yeah. rather than late. So I think you've got to treat the patient rather than the generality of the diagnosis. I think we've got to all remember that uh, young patients don't always stop when you tell them to, and they will go and have instability episodes. So this will really shape people's thinking around how unstable is this knee? How high risk is it? Because you want to save that medial meniscus. You lose that medial meniscus, you're really going to get into trouble uh, from that perspective. So I think uh, it's a real eye-opener in terms of thinking how to deal with patients and just remember that each patient has to be treated as an individual. Uh, and that's a really good point, Prof. And I think just generally, as we talk about, you know, RCTs, hugely important. We all know the importance of them, but they give you a general answer and you still have to adapt that knowledge and that and that data to the patient in front of you. I agree. And, and do you feel there's, you know, in, maybe implications, it's maybe a strong word, but like with regards to these patients now in the NHS, you know, we're, we're, we're a lot of places still struggling to get back to uh, prioritizing these injuries as best they can. Do you think there is implications for that? I, I think there is. I think what we're showing here is that these patients are going to damage their knees. And yeah. one thing orthopedics really lost out on during the pandemic is the prioritization process in that everything that was orthopedic got deprioritized. And I think we've got to put it back on the agenda 
that we are compromising these patients' knee health, we're compromising their future mobility, we're adding future cost. Yes, it's not cancer, but in reality, this is something we need to do uh, much better. And we need to advise these patients better and we need to try and streamline them. Remember, this is day surgery. This is outpatient surgery. We shouldn't be that limited in being able to do it. So I'm really grateful to Elvira and Seb for putting this uh, out there for the readers. I, 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 I totally agree. And I think, like you say, it really allows you to counsel the patient very clearly, I think, with this data here. Uh, Elvira, maybe if I come back to you for the sort of final thoughts, you know, what are your sort of, I suppose, your feelings about how this fits into the current literature, the sort of take home messages, but also maybe uh, sort of caveating it with any limitations of the study that you want to highlight? Before speaking about the limitation, I really want to say the, the important feeling of, of, the, of the study is the, the cutoff. Yeah. It's really one year. If we need to remember something for the patient, the, the one year is a cutoff regarding the delay between incident injury and surgery. Mm -hmm. So it's a very clear message we can give to our patient, the first, first of all. Yeah. And it could be a, a limitation, but I believe because it's a single center study, it's also a strength. Yeah. As you can see, the study uh, from Christiani published in Atroscopy two years ago with a big, a big database also. And it's, it's a strength for a study to get a, a one single center study. We could argue, of course, it's a retrospective study in blah, blah, with a limitation and as we all know, but actually the cartilage status was collected from the same operative report from the, the three senior surgeons using ICRS, as Professor Lustig said, and it's pretty accurate. Yeah. And we are still collecting those data, I should say, prospectively. Yeah. So, yeah. And... But the main limitation of, of this study is we could not properly address the relationship between the delay and meniscal tears, but it was not the main focus of the study. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And I think, I think that's a really a nice balanced way to look at it. And like you say, you can easily create limitations from retrospective work like this, but I think it adds so much and, and very clearly adds so much. And there's a lot of control with that as well, with the fact, that, like you say, the single center and the way it's all been assessed. No, I think that's a very, very fair assessment. Well, guys, I, I that, that was great. And I'm afraid that's all we have time for. But, you know, really congratulations on, I, th I think, a great study that, you know, it has a very clear message and a very clinically adaptable message, which I think is really important. And thank you so much to all of you for taking the time to join us today. And to our listeners, we do hope you've enjoyed joining us. And we encourage you to share your thoughts and comments through social media and like. Feel free to post on social media about anything we've discussed here today. And thanks again for joining us. Take care, everyone.